there's an important thing too, kind of baked into what you were saying, the mindset of the past few years has been how hard is it going to be to raise the next round? Mm-hmm. Well, an assumption baked into that is that we need to, we raise the next that round. That there will be one. Yes. Right. The yes. best mm-hmm. companies throughout history, you pretty quickly get to a point where you control your own destiny, you're cash flow positive, you're only raising money if you want to raise money, mm. but you never need to raise money. And the, yeah. almost all of the very best companies, you know, with the exception of like a Tesla, that's like a very different case where it's like manufacturing physical yeah. world stuff, very capital intensive. You know, even Amazon like didn't raise that much money uh, in the in the VC markets and the private. They took out debt as a public company, but that's a different mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Like the faster you can get to controlling your own destiny, just the better you're gonna be. Period. This week in startups is brought to you by Coda. Coda is the all-in-one doc for teams. If you've got a stack of niche workflow tools, or if you've been buried in docs and spreadsheets, Coda is the doc that brings it all together. Startups can get a $1,000 credit at coda.io slash twist. Lemon.io. Need to speed up your product development without draining your budget? Hire vetted engineers from Europe at lemon.io. Go to lemon.io slash twist to get 15% off for the first four weeks. And Reforge. Reforge is a career development platform for top professionals in growth, product, marketing, and engineering. Their summer cohort starts July 18th. So apply for membership today at reforge.com slash twist. All right, everybody. Welcome. It's, uh, it's Monday and here we are. No, it's Tuesday. But it feels like Monday because we all had a nice long weekend. If I feel like Monday, I'm like so ready to start the week yesterday. All weekend, I was like, you've been on one since we got back from Miami. You're like, you it, I'm clearly people are the sun for Jason. Now he's just like, here, we are going to do this and this and this and this and this is going to happen. And <laughs> here's I need the to like, here's the play. Here's the play. Let's go. Well, I was wondering, are you even coming back from that? Are you just going to stay? I am. Uh, all right, everybody. So yeah, welcome to the show. We'll, welcome we'll include show, this everybody. in the show. Uh, David Rosenthal is with us, you know, from Acquired FM. We like to have him by once in a while just to have a little trio here to to, to bat around the news. But it was a uh, nice. Uh, yeah, everybody had a nice weekend. I take it. Yeah, everybody was had a restful week. Oh, Great, restful. Shut it all down. We needed it. Yeah, it's been a bit of a. Um, a friend of mine sent me a meme, and it was like. God was like, oh my God, I'm, I love you all so much. Now deal with. And then it had like a blank space and he just wrote in it like monkey box. So it was like a, it was a card of God, like cradling the earth, you know, like shaking uh-huh. salt on or whatever. Like, you know, God's making his, you know, his little cauldron of our lives. And I was like, what, what do we have to worry about this summer? And I'm like, I'm just worrying about like, yeah, getting on the lake or something. I'm trying to figure out what your, anybody got big summer plans? Anybody planning a, hot podcaster summer because i feel like this is the year of the hot podcaster summer and we got three summer? podcasters here what's on your hot podcasting summer plans david Ooh, we had a hot podcasting may and we're gonna you did you did your a, live show events events yeah, events we did events, events. So we did arena show in seattle which was nice unbelievable at the new climate pledge i so chase center in san francisco is amazing but i gotta yes. say climate pledge is unreal they spent over a billion dollars on this place it was just like they are Gold going for plated. it with these arenas, yeah. Well, they because they're trying to get the the Sonics back, which is just uh, criminal. But uh, I so always felt that. that was crazy that the S- Seattle SuperSonics left. Oh, it's such that a was, good basketball town, like mm-hmm. you know, yeah, just, and the, it's so many billionaires from like Microsoft and Amazon. Like, yeah. there's like 50 people there who will billionaire billion billionize yeah. that team. Oh, there will there is. I mean, people have been saying this for years, so who knows? But like. There, there's got to be a team coming to like come on to Seattle. I was living like, in just, Seattle when they imploded the arena. Uh, it was oh, really the so most sad. heartbreaking. Oh, the, um, uh, the, you know the the one the Kingdom or the, the, kingdom. the key arena. The Kingdom. The kingdom. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 I'm t- old. Like it was a while ago. Was a long time ago. I love it. That was the it was King a, but Jr. that was days. that was back when nobody knew that Gary Payton was, was a dirtbag, and we all just thought he was so hot. Yeah, but it, it was a um, more innocent times. <laughs> And never meet your heroes. Um, filed under. Never meet yeah. your heroes. You live long uh, but, enough. But it, it was an iconic looking stadium. I remember from like the incredible. NBA games. It was iconic. Went, I don't know. So they saved the roof. Luxury. It was from the World's Fair in uh, whenever ah. they built the Space Needle. So they saved mm-hmm. the roof. Right. They lifted the roof up and then they built a completely new arena under it. Uh, so hot, hot podcast cool. summer for you is going to be maybe another oh. uh, stop on the acquired world tour. Well, so we, so we, did, so we did that. 
And then we did a really cool event um, at Emergence Capital's CEO Summit. We interviewed oh. Eric Yuan from Zoom and Peter Gassner nice. from Viva. Uh, oh, great that was guy. Carmel. Mm-hmm. And then we did Capital Camp just last week in Columbia, Missouri, which is beautiful. But wow. uh, man, we're exhausted now. <laughs> you must be you know, too. Here's the thing. Both of you. Um, I don't Jason know. Doesn't, doesn't, Jason doesn't get, get tired. tired. Not really. No. He doesn't get the cold. He doesn't get in, tired. In he comes def- back. Everybody's like in recovery mode, and Jason's like, "Let's go." Turns it up. Okay. Turns on the afterburners. I used to I pronounce it indefa- a- indefatigable, but I'm indefatigable. I think indefatigable. It's pr- indefatigable is how I've been described. And so, you have defatted, some- which is probably why you have all this extra energy. I have defat. Indefat. What? indefat. You, oh, you, you got rid of the fat. You, you yeah. defatted. So I got de- I got rid of the fat, and now I'm in the fatigable. <laughs> and now he's in the zone. Does like it. <laughs> yeah. I heard some rumors about a uh, twist world tour happening. We're we're planning doing like a five city tour, I think, and uh, very similar to what you did, like you know, just for the fans to meet the fans and hang out. Like maybe five cities. I don't know, twenty oh. bucks a ticket, something just so you don't burn that's the exactly ticket. What and, we did. It was so good. Yeah. So I think that's like a nice thing to do and just meet fans. But I'm I'm just trying to figure out like what startups would want you know and so we have some ideas we're going to just bat around but i you know i want to make it plug and play so it's easy so molly and i could like do literally you know i don't know three of them in a week you know do monday wednesday friday boston new york miami boom 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 we could just be like rock stars you know <laughs> travel between each city and get it done in <laughs> a week you know mm-hmm. get it done in yeah. a week i mean if we have you know if we, what i would do is i would send two teams so i'd have like two people go to boston the day before have two people go to miami uh, or go to new york on monday we do the monday the next day you know the, the boston people go to florida this is what dryer Straits did on their big tours when they were doing like uh, the brothers in arm tours they had two stages so one stage would be setting up in philly while the other one was playing you know in boston or something yeah. you know so they had two sets of gear and they could just play f- you know six or seven nights kind of situation because molly and i would be on stage for 90 minutes we can we're pros at this but you got yeah. big plans for the summer, Molly? Yeah. Anything coming up for you in the well, hot podcasting summer? Here's what happened to my child. Here's what oh. happened to my summer, which is that yeah. my child uh, and his stupid work ethic was uh. like, he turned 15 and mm. he was like, I want a car, so I'm getting a job. Oh, so, so now he has a job. Him. He starts huh. today. It's his first day of the job. But I'm like, well, wow, I want to go job. to Greece. Wow. And you go got Greece. a job. So yeah, now yeah. I just got to figure out how to go hmm. to Greece without him i guess huh yeah <laughs> anyway yes i had a whole i mean uh, this however, is i have started yeah. my hot summer off perfectly i want you guys to know because i saw top gun this weekend two times Ooh. it was you saw it twice i saw it on saturday and i saw it again on monday <laughs> oh, so the, my so the God, female lead that is in, demented in gun, monica what? i'm still my, taking uh, this in amazing my wife jenny grew up with her she's from marin <laughs> who is jennifer connelly the, the, the female star monica oh really bravo yeah, Barbara. Wait a yeah. second. I you saw six hours of Top Gun this weekend. It was five. It was two and a half hours. That I, I did, and I would do it oh. again. I'm, I, I want to go tonight. I mean, people are losing. I it I is. told you last awesome. year it's supposed to be unbelievable, yep. and that people told me it was the best Tom Cruise movie ever when they saw it a year and a half ago. I know. Was okay, were so they is right? It better than the first one. Is it the best top? Is it the best Tom Cruise movie ever? Man. That's a tough one. Come on. It's such a big, top really, three? you can't just like, it's top three. Yeah. It's okay, incredible. Wow. He's so restrained. He's so, like, it's just like, also, if you are the world's mm. giant nerd, which I am, and Top Gun is your number one favorite movie of your whole mm. entire life, oh then my God. Here we go. to, this Top Gun Maverick will just absolutely thrill you because it's like Easter egg after Easter egg after like callback oh. after callback. Like the opening uh-huh. scene, not to give too much away, is a shot for shot remake of the original, but like uh-huh. with today's planes and and so quality like it, you just immediately are just like usa usa like i let's came go. out of there just like <laughs> let's go so fired up apparently uh, so still, is, uh, still is tom cruise is he like the older like mentor figure or is he still the heartthrob in this one uh it's all about tom cruise this movie yeah. is only about map right about no, map. no more spoilers okay no, yeah, wait, yeah, wait, wait, wait. no more spoilers go uh, see it immediately and but on thursday when we do this anywhere, streaming, but IMAX. we'll talk IMAX. about the new obi-wan so get you got to get your obi-wan on if you haven't i watched that I it was a very too. relaxing. Yeah, I had a, I yeah, had a, a big lot of old good. birthday party. Oh, oh, right. You oh, do you mm-hmm. have a party? Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, thirty. Thirty-two. I've just been partying since like last Wednesday, and now I'm like, okay, back to work. 
I, I was I went to Cabo for the weekend. I was at a party, a uh, friend of mine's uh, birthday party, and it was quite nice. Uh, quite nice. nice. I can't talk about it because I signed an NDA apparently. But my party um, was exactly like that. The uh, yeah. the, sure. the highlight of the of this party was we were playing cards under like a nice uh, veranda type thing. Like I don't know what you call that in Italy when they have like a trellis or something above you. I don't know what they call that. Uh, it was like quite a nice. pergola. A pergola. Like a pergola. We're yeah. like in a yeah. pergola and uh, on the beach and there's some boats out there and this boat all of a sudden you know we look up and there's a boat smashing into the rocks and this boat is just capsized all of a sudden with you know six or seven people on it and it's what? like a big like fishing boat like small yacht type situation you know it's probably got three cabins and you know two levels and it's on the rocks molly getting so we like how did that happen and we, we the theory was like it was moored and uh the anchor broke and you know the, this uh you know cabo situation is a little bit rough the ocean and it's getting smashed against the rocks Man, and Lord. uh i said oh look the uss solana <gasps> oh, oh, <laughs> and there was somebody blow. at the table who had a very blow, large position in solana oh, and they were like oh no oh, and I, I kid you not they tried to pull this boat off the rocks you know there, there's people on oh. like there are people on paddle boards pulling ropes out to other boats. And for the next hour, oh we God. watched the USS Solana tip over Brutal. and then finally break apart in the ocean, fully capsized. And they shut the beach down because oil and parts of the boat, because this thing got so smashed at the rocks, glass, you know, everything in the boat is just in the water. Uh, it was the first time I've ever seen a boat capsize. And, you know, this is water. You would be like, yeah, I can swim across that water. No yeah. problem. And turns out a boat was demolished into tiny little pieces That's of crazy. rubble <laughs> almost also, instantly. i had one conversation with that guy after several glasses of wine and i went home and bought 300 dollars worth of solana <laughs> oh no <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, listen for what it's worth it's so easy bet, to go I after crypto very right now. small because i'm not good at this game i bet very small if you're a startup you know you have to save where you can i'm talking time i'm talking money and i'm talking bandwidth that's why we love Coda. Coda is one document to rule them all. And here is a quick example. My guy Presh just made a beautiful template for investor updates that you can go and duplicate right now at thisweekinstartups.com slash investor updates. Why should you send investor updates? Well, the more informed your investors are, the more engaged they will be in your startup. That means they're going to help you find other investors. They're going to invest more money themselves. Those are the two most critical factors. And maybe they'll help you find customers or help you with an exit. That's why you want to keep investors up to date. But people don't know what should go in an investor update. Well, we made a template. And Coda has a ton of templates. And you can just duplicate a template and get to work right away. It's almost like they do half the work for you. Coda works right out of the box. It's completely customizable. Your text and your tables live together in the same document, which means all your valuable data, objectives, and strategies are in one place. And it's nice and clean. Nothing gets lost. And your team is literally on the same page. So join the productivity revolution and sign up for Coda today. Head to coda.io slash twist to sign up and get a $1,000 credit. That's C-O-D-A dot I-O slash twist for $1,000 off. I think it's fine to play some bets, but I mean, yeah. maybe let's start there. Um, we, the markets, David, have been crazy. And uh, crypto, of course, um, we knew that that would be, if we're going to move to value investing, a place where maybe there's been a, a larger focus on raising money and building cap tables they're not exactly cap tables but you know the, the focus has been on selling the vision and not building the reality what's your take on it now did you because you had started dipping your toe i believe into some crypto uh, and thinking about it particular yeah so uh one how much are you down on solana and then two how do you look at uh you know and I, i'm not saying this in a joking way an industry that's been focused almost exclusively on vision and raising and maybe five or 10 percent on actually building products well um fortunately i'm still up on solana uh nice. as i'm sure is your your friend he's doing yeah. just fine <laughs> uh but uh i mean i think like it's trite to say right but like this is this is what happens has happened many times before in crypto this is waves in all startups and you know, I think the the tide will go out and we'll see who's got swimsuits on in the old mm. Howard Marks quote. And yeah, we'll see who doesn't. And, uh, you know, I think there are plenty of projects in crypto that have swimsuits on Solana being one of them, in my opinion. Yeah. 
not investment advice, but, um, yeah. uh, but yeah, and plenty like, um, have you guys had Adam from brain trust on twist? Mm, I don't think so. No. Oh, you should. He's great. He was the founder of doctor on demand and, um, uh, he founded a company called uh, web three project called brain trust. You know, they're doing dozens of millions in revenue, real customers, enterprise fortune 500. Um, it's like, a the best, the crude analogy is like mm. Fiverr or Upwork, but um, Got it. but as a token economy, so that the oh, you're I do remember this. Yes. to yeah. to stay on the network, and um, you know they're doing great. They're, uh, Audius is another one building real businesses. So like we had I, Audius I on, yeah, yeah. Audius is an interesting one. They're going to kind of be like Spotify plus the clearinghouse for all the rights and music if that rights, works. Yeah. And the mm-hmm. three of us made a track together, and we played you know three different roles in that. We could split up the equity in it. Um, exactly. So, so yeah, you're, I mean, no I mean, doubt. So there's tons of craziness yeah, out there that'll it get It sounds like away. though you are feeling like there are products. Like that seems to be that's been our yeah. big complaint, you know, on the show. I think that's what Jason has said many times, and we've sort of said like, look, the primary use case for this so far has been like store of value and gambling. Token go up, yeah. Token, token go, go up. up. Exactly. <laughs> token um, go up. T G U. And we yep. business model. There was like a little back and forth this weekend. Jason was tweeting about this question of like, where are the products, right? The, that people are getting yeah. value out of, consumers are getting value out of. It's been 10 years. And somebody I thought made a somewhat fair point that it, at this point, if you give another 10 years, because like internet companies weren't necessarily providing value for the customer immediately, mm. that it always takes 10 years for any new technology to find a market. Do you think that's fair yeah jason's like no mm -hmm. i'm just gonna lob this bomb out here and see Mm. what happens like where (laughs) are we in the cycle of any new technology with the caveat that like no one was swapping derivatives and financializing the out of the early internet to make it you know to turn it into like a trillion dollar store of value my guess is we're probably somewhere in between the situation in 1989 2000 with the dot com bust where like mm. there was real there were real companies, there's real technology there, there was a lot of fraud, it got washed out, but like we came out the other side. I think we're somewhere in between that and like just lots mm. of financial fraud and hype. Um I don't think we're totally in fraud and hype, but mm. you know, there was <laughs> it was unprecedented over the past few years. I think a lot of people who are making the analogy weren't there for it. So, you know, like somebody was like, well, you know, this is kind of like 85 to 94 in the internet era. And I was like, the, the web browser came out like in the early, you know, like 93 and 94 kind of got commercialized. So actually what you're talking about is really the PC era and the dial up era where you mm-hmm. couldn't show images on AOL or, you know, if you did download an image, it might be five minutes. Like literally you could download a picture, but you had to go get a cup of coffee. Oh. And so... I, I was kind of like, I don't know if your 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 time periods are correct here. I think there's a lost decade for crypto. I think all the interesting stuff that happened in the first three or four years, you know, 2009, 10, 11, 12, Bitcoin starts emerging and, and, and other projects. I think then it got so derailed by the um, just massive influx of money. People really did suspend disbelief, put too much money into it. And since money is part of the rails of this, it's kind of like, You know, it's kind of like the electricity of this, right? Like, so you couldn't build the internet without electricity and CPUs. Like, you can't build this without the internet, without, you you can, you can abstract the servers that you would have to normally buy, but you kind of replace them with cash and money on the rails. So I think we've lost, you know, a number of years to people just getting obsessed with the money racing process as opposed to the building. So I do think this is, could be like a really great thing, this recession for crypto, because are the next coin offerings gonna you know pull a hundred million dollars out i know kevin rose did a hundred million dollars in nft sales but he's kevin rose so he's kind of a legend he's got a big following but i just wonder if you know if we have less money flowing in then people can focus less on you know their net worth and you know the acceleration of the stuff and more on the, the use case and they have to deliver in order to get the reward as opposed to now they have to pitch in order to get the reward and I followed it up, Molly, with a, uh, you know, a tweet the other day, I think yesterday or the day before. Listen, there are, there's a group of founders who got better at telling the story than making the reality. And I think that we need to get into reality building mm-hmm. mode uh, more than anything. You know, it's, it, it's great. You know, we all teach people how to pitch too. You know, we want people to tell the story well. Molly teaches pitching. We, at our accelerator, we teach people to pitch. We give them notes on their decks, hey, how to make the story more believable. 
at a certain point, you know, like uh, seeing is believing and I'd like to see the products. And so that's what I'm literally training my team to do is just a little more um, actually building of stuff. And, and, and that's been, I think, the dialogue. We had, uh, Molly, a bunch of venture capitalists, uh, myself included, mm -hmm. um, talking about VC Winter. When you're scaling your startup quickly, hiring engineers can slow you down like nothing else. Don't I know it? Well, here's some good news. Lemon.io will find you the perfect candidate in 48 hours. What's Lemon.io, you ask? Well, they're a marketplace of engineers from Europe. They're going to match you with a candidate within 48 hours. And if it doesn't work out, they will replace the developer right away. They test and interview every developer to eliminate the risk of a failed project. And guess what? When you hire in a European time zone, you'll have your developers working 24-7. What a competitive advantage. So launch portfolio founder Drew Fabricant, he said Lemon.io was a game changer for his startup Scout, which is a lead gen platform. Drew was under the gun to hire a developer with a very specific skill set, and Lemon.io delivered a great candidate and they were a pleasure to work with. Not only did Drew find exactly what he was looking for, but Lemon also delivered them a second engineer just as fast. So if you could use a full-time or part-time developer to run your projects faster, go to lemon.io slash twist. That's lemon.io slash twist, and you'll receive a 15% discount for the first four weeks of work with a developer. So maybe yeah. we, we could start there and queue up the VC reaction to the recession, to the downturn, and then maybe David's thoughts on um, if he's aligned with this vision yeah, of there has what been, the next yeah. year is going to be about. Yeah. There's been a lot of, uh, if you're watching the video, a lot of this, a lot of just putting the hand up being like, you know what, just hold up, calm yeah. down. <laughs> According to CB Insights, funding for global startups is uh, about $58 billion in commitments midway through Q2, which is on pace to drop by 20% quarter over quarter, all uh, uh, of the early stage investors, at, at really investors at every stage, I think are making the same warning uh, about a VC winter, Sequoia Craft, Benchmark, Lightspeed, YC, Jason sent a note to all of our founders. Uh, Wall Street Journal noting that in past downturns, the Federal Reserve cut rates and pumped money into markets to support the economy, providing liquidity and cheap capital, which as we all know, was great for <laughs> all the crypto projects we just discussed and also the funding environment generally. But this time, of course, the central bank is raising rates and taking money out of the system, mm. making money more expensive. Um, and of course, then, you know, as we have discussed, almost ad nauseum at this point, and we're so early in this downturn, runway is everything. Um, Fred Wilson of Union Square Ventures and an early Twitter investor said in a blog post, quote, I would be planning to ride this thing out for at least 18 months. Or more, Sequoia said it's not going to be a V-shaped recovery. It's going to be a market downturn that impacts consumer behavior, labor markets, supply chains. And Bill Gurley tweeted, the cost of capital has changed materially. And if you think things uh, are like they were, then you are headed off a cliff like Thelma and Louise. I really love his like old guy references. Well, I Thelma guess you're headed off a cliff hands, everybody. like <laughs> Thelma and Louise. <laughs> right? That's my Bill Gurley impersonation at the table when we play cards. Oh, episode, uh, the the all in oh summit with him and, and Brad was just great. That was yeah, everything. Because yeah, Brad did is you like, boing, 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 boing. Yeah. Did and you tee it like, up with uh, Bill you've predicted five of the last three recessions? I, uh, <laughs> so that was somebody else's joke about another person. So that was a, like all good comedy. That was, I, I workshopped that one off of somebody else's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, I mean, so uh, what, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, I know David, like, you know, you're, you're, you haven't lived through a ton of cycles here, but what, what is your plan as you deploy your, you know, uh, micro fund and go into your next fund and then have to mentor these companies that are at the earliest stages? What, what, what are the discussions you're having with your founders? Totally. Well, um, you know, it's funny. I graduated from college in 2007. So right at the peak and then like right into the crash and I was working on wall street. So that yep. was, uh, that was fun times, but I don't know. My lesson from that is like, it was fine. You know, like, yeah, it was rough for a couple of years, but like, it was mm. fine. It'll be fine again. Everything will be fine in the long run. Um, but I was thinking the whole time when you were describing everything and I've been reflecting on this too. Um, so the book, The Snowball, that Alice Schroeder wrote about Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, it's so good. It's a classic. It was the main source, like the backbone of our Berkshire Hathaway mm. series. So she opens it up. I think it came out. I want to say it was published 
like 2010, maybe 2009, 2010. So kind of the middle of the financial crisis. Uh, she opens the book with uh, the scene at the Allen and Company conference. It was either 99 or 2000. I think it was 2000. And like right before the crash, like the, mm. you know, the equivalent of November of last year. And uh, Warren gives this speech and like he hadn't said anything about dot-com, the tech bubble, anything. And he gives the kind of reluctantly gives this speech at, uh, at the conference. And his point is, he's, he, he says, he's like, interest rates are everything. Interest rates are the law of gravity in the economy. And like, mm. whatever you think you're, you know, doing, like, you should always just look back at interest rates and like, they go up, gravity goes up. They go down, gravity goes down, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and like, that's what's going on here. And, you know, they're already... Like the, the Fed is not going to bring them back down. Gravity is only going to go up right now. So like, yes, yeah, it's, it's, I think everybody's right. It's going to be hard for a while. But, you know, in the long run, is, the way you make money is you build things of value. Right. Do you think and that doesn't change? Yeah. Overstating and that doesn't it? change at all. Yeah, that doesn't change. So do you think like this level of sort of warning is CYA by the investor class or... You know, I mean, it seems like it's a fair warning for people like prepare for 18 months, like get prepped. Um, but it sounds like you do you think it's not that severe or do you more think like, look, this, like all things is survivable by smart, capable, prepared people? I think w one of our uh, at our talk at Capital Camp, we did our 12 favorite lessons from 200 stories, seven years of acquired. And one of the lessons is never never fight against a will to survive. Like you can survive anything. It's just about your will, no matter how bad things get like the best companies, Nvidia, you know, Facebook, people forget, like people thought they were dead at the IPO. They missed mobile. Like you can survive anything. <laughs> and so it's just about the mindset. So I think it's good of VCs to be like push. The more you can, as a founder and a company have a mindset of like, I'm here to survive. You know, we talked to Eric Yuan, like he literally, we played the clip in the talk. He, we asked him about you know what what his goals were building a company and his answer was I was always trying to survive 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 he said it like seventeen times <laughs> like wow. if that's your mindset as a founder no matter what the market you're going to be set up for success um, so I think it's good for founders now to start having that mindset I mm -hmm. think also there's a little bit with VCs you always got to look at their incentives so all these people that are telling companies this well of course they want to pay better prices for companies so like there's a little bit of an incentive for them to be doing this um you know it, it, i you could see that like cynically that hey maybe people want to pay a lower price or um since there are not going to be major exits on the back end they know they have no choice but to pay lower prices in order to make their funds viable so it could also be pragmatism also you know a lot of vcs were like you know what if it's going to cost 15 million or 20 million for a stage stage fund coming out of an accelerator, I don't like this price, but I'll pay it because it's triple what we were paying 10 years ago or seven years ago, but the exits are triple as well, you know, or they're five X as well, uh, the big ones. So, you know, maybe this is the new normal. And as uh, Warren Buffett said, and you um, recapped quite eloquently, like gravity's gravity, like, if you can't raise large amounts of money and you know things are gonna stay low for a little while and it might loosen up in the future but i do think vcs in my experience are trying to reduce the number of zeros and trying to get founders motivated um who haven't seen this before to take it really seriously um because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my lord the absolute um i don't want to use like the word entitlement here because it's not like uh, founders came into this with this, you know, like, oh, I can just raise money. It's my God given right. It's in the Constitution. I get a gun and, you know, I get to say whatever I want on a soapbox and I'm entitled to like a million dollar seed round. <laughs> like, right. Uh, no, I don't think people thought that, but I do think what they were trained to think over time, uh, which might have put some entitlement in folks or just unrealistic expectations might be a better way to describe it is that founders started to have unrealistic expectations that each round of funding was easier. And the funding was not tied to performance. Um, really, it was tied to new market entrance. So you, mm -hmm. you know, when Masa came in or Tiger or Kotu or these new funds, you know, these new entrants were going to place bets They had no choice but to place the bets or get in the management fees. So, you know, each round gets easier. Now, each subsequent round gets harder, mm -hmm. or 
the cumulative effort you put into the last three rounds is going to be double to close the fourth round. Like people are not going to expect that kind of gravity. So, you know, you might have been able to dunk and do a 360 dunk and now you're just not going to be able to get off your heels. Like you're right. going to be wearing lead boots. Like let's right. see you dunk with lead boots on. Like, and I think that's why VCs are so concerned is, you know, but I had three different companies tell me, hey, we laid people off in the last two weeks or we did a reorg. And they didn't go to their boards or consult their investors, you know, which is the founders right. I don't, there's nothing in a board document or that says like you, if you do layoffs, you have to tell your board or consult your investors. Like a, a founder can right size the company. Oh, I, I'm trying to think of any situation where I've seen that in a document. So I saw people doing, you know, call it five, 10% up to like 25, 35%, um, or just make the plans and just inform us this is happening. It yeah. started or it's happening to me incredible because you know in some cases they had six months and now they have 12 or they had 12 and now they have 24 in one case i think it was like 24 to like 36 or the person put the infinity sign in front of it and i'm like okay here we go yeah people are good. actually taking the medicine and, and that to me is great because if like you said if you if you don't give up then uh, there's a chance for a return but if you give up now we've we've literally marked that to zero forever the company's out of well, business game over this game, game over. only happens now we've locked in up. a zero chip right. in a chair but there's an important thing too kind of baked into what you were saying the mindset of the past few years has been how hard is it going to be to raise the next round mm -hmm. well an assumption baked into that is that we need to we raise the next that round. there will be one yes. right the yes. best mm -hmm. companies throughout history you pretty quickly get to a point where you control your own destiny you're cash flow positive you're only raising money if you want to raise money mm. but you never need to raise money in the yeah. almost all of the very best companies, you know, with the exception of like a Tesla, that's like a very different case where it's like manufacturing, physical yeah. world stuff, very capital intensive. You know, even Amazon like didn't raise that much money uh, in the in the VC markets or in the private. They took out debt as a public company, but that's a different mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Like the faster you can get to controlling your own destiny just the better you're going to be, period. You know, Viva Systems is a great example of this. We interviewed Peter. Most people don't know about this company because they only raised $7 million of venture capital and they only burned three of it. And they're a $20 billion public company <laughs> mm -hmm. doing high, high touch enterprise sales to very large Fortune 500 clients. Usually you think you need to burn a lot of cash to do that. It's just a mm -hmm. mindset thing. Like very quickly... They were That's like, no, we don't need to do excellent, that. Excellent, excellent point too, which is like, why are you, is, if you're a SaaS company, why are you at a series E at a $2 billion valuation? Like maybe we should just use fewer letters in the alphabet for the next few <laughs> years. <laughs> it made sense over the past few years because capital was so available and cheap. Like why not? And especially yeah. as a founder, you take secondary, of course, but like, you know, yeah. that's not the way to build a great company. I. I'm just really happy to see such an honest, candid dialogue very early in this game. Um, I, we were sounding the alarm bells, you know, for, you know, two years about how frothy this was. And, you know, I always would tell people the same thing, like this feels frothy, you know, it's like a, it's like a cop, you know, you, get, you ever get the cappuccino and you're like, oh my God, so much great foam. And then you're like, but is there a drink here? Because I, I'm in like a venting cup here and like, I, I'm trying to find the liquid, you, you know, you get, a, you ever get a Starbucks, you start tilting it and you're like is there any liquid in this cup or did you just give me a cup of foam and i was starting to feel you know like i'm getting a cup of foam here i'm looking for the revenue i'm looking for the customer and it, it's been a very frustrating uh year or two for me in a lot of meetings or working with our associates here and researchers at launch and, and the syndicate saying like what well, can i what's the revenue and who are the customers and they're like oh this person is incredibly charismatic i'm like okay well what's your thesis they're like oh this is you know it's a huge market and i'm like can we have a discussion about, you know, customers, product team, customers, product team. And I just, I try to center all my discussions when we make an investor around the customers, the product and the team. And boy, it's very easy for everything else to just, you know, take center stage. And so for the people who've gotten really good at performance and selling, now it's time to get good at hiring great team members at a, at, at a reasonable price that are going to kick ass managing them well. Uh, making sure you're getting every drop of efficiency out of every person on your team, which is what I'm working on right now. <laughs> which, you know, it, I might seem a little crazy right now because I've been very laissez-faire, like letting people kind of pursue their uh, stuff. But I just told everybody last week, send me your calendars. 
Um, and let's look at, I, I'm doing a calendar review with the investment team today at our investment team meeting, David, because I was like, are we as efficient as we need to be? What are people spending time on? And let's just have an honest dialogue about that. Do we need to meet more companies? Or do we need to go deeper on companies? Who's meeting with the most companies? Why are we get are we are we meeting with companies we should have disqualified before we did the meeting? So we're kind of doing meetings to have our calendars filled, but we should be going and hunting more than sorting. So I think this is the time and I'm doing it myself also at inside um, where we've been profitable for now like a lot of quarters and we just raised a little bit on Republic. Because I oh, like nice. the idea of like, I just like the we had done it on seed invest previously, I like both those platforms, I like the idea of our customers having it, but I'm super, super focused on profitability, you know, and having oh, every team member be efficient. So go through the list of every team member, do a one on one with them do a one on few, and just have that discussion with your teams. Are, are we putting the right amount of resources on each project? What projects are we working on? Which ones hit the bottom line? And are we going to make it through this? You know, and I, y- you really do have to have that discussion about efficiency. Mm-hmm. Um, you and, and layoffs are part of that. It's a good example yeah. of uh, it's it's never it's only game over when you decide it's game over. Like there's mm-hmm. so many times yeah. over the past few years where you probably could have said game over, right? And still, and here you yeah. are building a good business. It's really become a, a, a fantastic business now. You know, we're over four million dollars in revenue a year. It's profitable. We've got thirty people over there, and then the velocity in which new products are coming out has just been great. So it's it's you know I, I think I could ten x the revenue from here and have like a literal viable competitor to LinkedIn at some point, you know, or, you know, coexist to Reddit, LinkedIn, or some type of there. Reforge equals career development, career development equals a raise and a better title. It's that simple, folks. You work in growth, you work in product, maybe you work in marketing or engineering. Those are the most important functions in any startup and even the at scale companies, let's be honest. And this is where the magic happens at a company. Well, how do you make magic happen? Well, you join Reforge. They onboard new members in cohorts and they give them year round access to a bunch of program content that are going to make them better at their jobs. They also put you in a vetted community of your peers. You're going to get that networking, you're going to get your skills, you're going to get direct line of insight from leaders at the top companies across the tech industry. Reforge offers 16 programs built and led by top executives at companies like Uber, Slack, SurveyMonkey, Instacart, and Tinder. You're going to be in great company. You want that promotion? You want that raise? Well, how are you going to show you deserve it? You're going to show you deserve it by putting numbers on the board and you just put numbers on the board because you got those skills. So stay current on business trends and best practices. Join Reforge this summer. Their next cohort is starting July 18th. Apply for membership today at reforge.com slash twist. People ask me all the time, what should I invest in? Yourself. Reforge.com slash twist. You know, there's other news. Um, and I don't know if you saw this story, David. I know Molly did. But it's time for, as they say in the, you know, privately, this is not my term, but uh, privately in the media business, there's a term chicks for clicks. Uh, and there was yet another hit piece on a female founder. Uh, we had just gotten over talking about this, Molly, mm-hmm. and another one dropped this weekend. Uh, Glossy, Glossier, mm-hmm. is that Glossier. Glossier, Glossier yeah. founder, Emily Weiss, um, I guess, handed over the reins of the company that she built. And the New York Times decided, well, what a time to dunk on successful women. Never a bad time, really, if you want to get Never clicks. A Never a bad time to... Yeah. Uh, so in Especially a blog post... A capitalist woman? Oh, my God. Yeah. God no, I mean... Who built a brand on makeup? Ew. <laughs> exactly. Stuff. Yeah. So she yeah. she built this cosmetics company uh, from 2014 on. And um, the gender reporter at the New York Times, literally, <laughs> there's a gender reporter at the New York Times. I, I listen, I do, I'm not on the alt right. You know that. But I was shocked that the business story about women was relegated to the gender reporter. Like, I guess. She yeah. doesn't qualify for the business journalism section or, you know, reporters, but the gender reporter uh, wrote, the sunsetting of the girl boss is nearly complete, uh, as cynical as the headline as she could write. Um, and uh, here's the New York Times promoting the story. And so, of course, promotion of a story, as we know, sometimes goes a little bit more aggressive and, and clickbaity. And, and this is chicks for clicks. Uh, Emily Weiss, founder of Glossier and the face on the Mount Rushmore of startup culture. I, that's not true, but okay. Will no longer be the beauty company's CEO. She's the latest of the so-called girl bosses to step away from their creations, effectively marking the end of the archetype. I mean, what utter bull, <laughs> Molly, your thoughts. Nonsense. 
I mean, it's I mean, so embarrassing for the New York Times. Yeah, my thoughts are effectively unprintable. Like, unprintable. I mean, yeah. person builds excellent company that is a runaway hit with its target demographic. I mean, I remember working at Marketplace, like, and I don't know, five or six years ago, literally every woman of a certain age, like every woman in her 20s and 30s was like, oh my God, do you like Glossier, Glossier, Glossier? It was the only word on anyone's lips. It is, uh, near as I can tell, by all accounts, very successful. And having reached a point where uh, Emily Weiss thought maybe someone else should come in and take the reins because being the CEO is a really hard job and or this company is growing and I have other pursuits because I am only 37 years old and I've already crushed it once. So I'm going to go crush it somewhere else that you get girl boss. Mm. F- you. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it I have it told Jason. what happened there. Like, you know. Who cares? Good, Molly, you're you're great. Great. What were you going to say, Molly? You, said you told well, me. I was going to say, I told you once about being at a dinner with a female CEO founder when the the story came out about uh, Steph Corey of Away. Yes. And and this woman saying to me like, oh, no, we're all waiting for this. Like, we are all waiting for this version of the story to come out about yeah. us. We're too bitchy or we're too mean at this or whatever. When like every one of us has worked for an a-hole. Yes. Like it's fine for some and not for others. Like these, I don't, I don't understand why anybody is unironically using the term girl boss for any mm. reason whatsoever. Like, it's just like, it's a way to diminish. Nothing. It's a way to diminish the person. I, I, right. I just want to say it out. Right. I, I, and I know it's, I listen, She's not it's a my girl. friend. It's my friend, Sophia's brand. So I understand girl boss was like her way of saying like, you know, I'm capturing this and I, I respect Sophia and what she's built and she's a legit entrepreneur and she's awesome. But I think when you take her branding and then you're like, how do we diminish this person who's built an amazing company? And you're like, end of the girl boss archetype. It's like, yeah. I don't know that Emily is opting into that archetype. I don't think she modeled her career off of Sophia. So you're kind of just saying, let's ghettoize all of these women, put them over here in this box. They're all part of this silly little archetype of girl bosses, right? They're using the term girl boss not in the way Sophia used it, which was like taking back the power of that being a derogatory term. Right. You know, and I don't know. And the the away founder thing just also pissed me off too. But David, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's just ridiculous. It's like, um, you know, the complaint such as there is one that I could find in any of these pieces is like they were demanding bosses. Right. Okay. Uh, you I know, like think that's okay. the job. That's the job. I think that is the job. And it's hard to build a great company. Like, um, yeah, I just, you know, it's so um the other half of this, there there's the like completely terrible and just like puzzling, ridiculous, you know, gender aspect to all this, especially the gender reporter at the New York Times writing this. Um, but there's also just like the the traditional media versus tech and capitalism element here that i think is driving a lot of this too and it's like oh this is a subset of that david i think it's a very important point is there's an anti-capitalism vibe on the left which by the way as somebody who's voted democrat their entire life who is a capitalist i think actually that's all of us on this program i'm just like can you please stop this like we 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 there's i would say the majority of capitalists like in tech overwhelmingly are on the left and why are you driving us away like love us we'll make donations <laughs> we want to be part of it <laughs> like you're literally pushing us out of the tent we're like i thought this was our tent and you're like no 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 get that get out of the tent i'm like there's another tent across the street would you like us in that tent they're like no you can't go in that tent but you can't be in this one it's like so i stand in the middle of the street between the two tents they're like yeah that's where you belong i'm like okay well we're gonna need to put up a tent and that tent is going to be between these two parties, I think, is where the world is heading with this anti-capitalism. And by the way, I just said on this program, I asked everybody on my team to share their calendar with me mm-hmm. so I could talk to them about how they're optimizing their time. If mm-hmm. a woman did, and you know what? There are people writing notes right now. <laughs> Jake, how great idea. Somebody's in Slack right now watching this live. Can everybody share their calendar with me? I want to just go over your personal productivity and mentor you on time management. And on the weekend, I said, can somebody tell me the best time management systems that they've used and why? Because there are some people on the team who have empty calendars. And I'm wondering, like, maybe they would be good to have like something every day that they did at certain times to optimize their goals and their KPIs. 
if a woman did that, they'd be like obsessive compulsive Molly Wood, you mm-hmm. know, demands to Driving micromanage team, people's calendars, writing her calendar. team, micromanaging. 100%. You know, what is the, I will say, double standard. where's the anti-capitalist part in the Glossier thing, do we think? And I'm not saying that it has not existed. Um, it has, but I didn't see it here. Yeah, hold on. I, there was some, I, I, well, David, did you have a specific one uh, yeah. that you felt Tell was me, like, super? More, I think David. it's in the, yeah. the overall thread of like, are what these women have done wrong is be demanding bosses. Uh, right. And I think that is like, there's an inherent anti-capitalism. And want people to work hard there. and like, yeah, right, 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 right. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I um, don't know. This whole thing reminds all... me of, uh, I think this was a Sequoia framework. I can't remember where I, where I saw this. This might've been a Don Valentine thing. Uh, that like, if you think about people in the world, if you're looking for great founders, there's like a, you put it into people into a two by two matrix of, uh, satisfied and complacent with the world or dissatisfied with the world is sort of like you put that on one, one axis. And then on the other axis you put, uh, does something about it or talks about it. <laughs> and like the craziness about all of this is that like, it feels like whatever the New York times represents here, they're in the dissatisfied and talks about it, but doesn't do anything about it camp. And that's like, that is the most toxic quadrant to be in. If you're satisfied with the world, whether you do something or don't do something, like you're pretty happy to be around. But like, if you want a founder, somebody who's going to improve the world, you want to be dissatisfied and does something about it. And just like going after people who do something about, they see problems in the world or they see opportunities and they do something like that should be celebrated. Yeah. One of the things I hate about journalism today is this like generalization and repeating of allegations without specific names on them. So. Over the last several years, many of these women have stepped down from their roles of, for various reasons, M dash, including allegations of racism and toxic leadership, M dash, Ms. Weiss has stayed on. So they're like taking all the female bosses together. And I think the toxic leadership quote and the racism quote is that uh, the away founder had people of color in their support group, like customer support, and that because because they don't put in here what they're referring to, or even a link, they kind of are like making this generalization that female bosses are racist and toxic leaders. And it's like, hey, really? Because the way they say it, this is the New York Times. Over the last several years, many of these women have stepped down from their roles for various reasons, okay, including allegations of racism, toxic leadership. So you're kind of bucketing this whole group in the in the reader's mind as there's some like, pervasive racism and toxic leadership going on here which we all know is just not the case in the case of the away founder she was like everybody has to work over the holidays because we sell luggage and that's when we sell half our (laughs) products is the holidays so like this who what editor lets this line through like if i was editing this i'd say who are you talking about be specific Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no generalizations but because this is the gender reporter And I'm not saying gender is not a a viable topic. Sure, I would like to read stories about gender. I think it's cool to have a gender writer. But this is what happens when the gender writer writes the business story and nobody's editing them. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Be specific. Be specific. If you're going to make these allegations and bunch everybody together. This is what happens when an editor fails. There there is some journalism slander here. Yes, it is not I what happens. I said the editor should have edited this, don't it you think? It is not what happens when the gender reporter writes the business story. Like, watch it. The gender reporter might be a great business reporter. We don't know. I, okay. What we're talking about here is like this. Why? What are these generalizations? Where are editors failing? Most importantly, why are editors deciding that this is the story that needs to be written? Like, how okay, are we selection, in sure. the year of our Lord 2022 having a female CEO of a successful company step away and some editor somewhere being like, ooh, Let's make this a girl boss story and not having any self-awareness, like any awareness that this is going to go poorly because why wouldn't it? Like nobody ever stops and says, what does this have to do with her gender? If no, kill the story. Like if zero. Yes. Don't write it. Right. Like I just, I, it is just utterly baffling and it is only, I mean, to your point, David, it is only divisive, right? It divides 
men CEOs from women CEOs. It divides white women CEOs from pe- from c- women CEOs of color, right? Because then you have black women on Twitter being like, where's the outrage for black women CEO fo- or black women founders who are constantly getting their asses kicked. In fact, girl boss became a pejorative because it was like, it only meant white women. Like it literally is like, how can we tear down society even more like bit by bit by bit by bit and make sure that yes. no one is ever friends again? Uh, well, I think that is the, that is where, you know, this uh, journalism plus identity politics clickbait train leads you. Yeah. It just leads you to this nightmare scenario where you're like, you're saying everything has to be broken into little atoms. And, you know, this woman is a white woman, the person, in, you know, who had the complaint, you know, uh, is this color skin? Is this, you know, gender? And, and then all of a sudden it's like, did anybody ever ask, is this a kick ass business? Right. And do we need to dunk on this person? And it's like, well, if we don't dunk on them, we're missing an opportunity for clicks. I think this is why people have lost a little bit of respect for the, for, I mean, we expect, you expect process. this from Business Insider, right? You expect Business Insider to just be cynical and go for clicks. You expect Huffington Post to be cynical and go for clicks. But I think what's disappointing about this is it's the New York Times and they don't write anything positive about female founders. And it's just like this trend where it's just dunk, dunk, dunk. And even though, even though I just yelled at you about the general reporter, it is true that I read this whole story three times. And I still don't exactly know if Glossier is doing well as a business right now. Right. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I can't tell from yeah. this story. I so mean, if she left because everything's going great, like I don't even know if Emily Weiss left Glossier because everything's going great and she's ready to try something new or if something, something girl boss. I, I don't, I got I mean, they, Listen, they raised funding. Um, they say, and reach unicorn status. Those are incredible things. They laid off dozens of corporate staff members, which means nothing, right? Like yeah, you're always when you're literally just talking about how literally VCs just talking are telling about everybody that's to a do good that. thing. Yes, right, that's a good thing. And um, some s- company called Second Measure says that their sales were down twenty six percent. And then during the pandemic, lost a grapple with store closures. Well, <laughs> uh, okay. duh. Like so did Apple. <laughs> So did everybody. Mm-hmm. So again, like, it, it's really like, uh, right. so oh, and the retail seemed- oh, and the retail employees were upset about the pandemic. A glossier. Right. So like, where is the actual? This glossier person is a, a terrible seat. Hard time uh, getting direct to consumer customers, like uh, uh, other business. Yeah. All of the like, I just don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this it's is so part weird. of the like, I feel like I never know anything. I just know people's opinions about things or the labels that they want to put on those things. But I'm not sure what I know. Anyway, it was, I, it seems as though it was roundly rejected mm. on Twitter, I would hope. And yet it doesn't mean that some other female founder won't have some bull- girl boss story written because no one ever learns. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I just, don't, just I just don't even respond or I just write a a funny response back to the yeah, New York Times. Because right New York Times contacted me last night to like comment on their profile of Professor Galloway. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I, sorry, I, like, I, really? Here, here are my, here are my, here are my, I, I've been workshopping in my reply. Reply number one, who? <laughs> the New York Times uh, is doing, you, the New York Times number is doing two. a profile well, about a guy who co-hosts a show with one of its biggest names. Yeah. yeah. That, that, <laughs> that the New York well, Times itself promotes. Can yeah, I'm sidebar? like, hmm. I want to know Jesus Jason, what Christ, is your workshop so dirty. process for all in intros for all this? Like, what's um, roll back the curtain? So, David's like, I have other roll questions. back the curtain, roll hmm. back the curtain. Uh, so you know, in terms of comedy, uh, people are like, hey, you've got a good sense of humor and a quick wit. Um, well, I'm Irish and I'm a writer, and the, it came, and I came from Brooklyn where people just break each other's chops. Uh, but in all sincerity, like that was just kind of gave me probably like a four out of 10 on the humor scale sense of humor. But what happened was when I lived in LA, um, I became friends with uh, a gentleman named Kevin Pollack, who I met at a poker game, who was an actor. And um, he, uh, we made some jokes, uh, you know, in poker in this poker game, and then he invited me to his home game. And I was lucky enough to play in his home game for a while. Uh, when I lived there. And you know, he would have, you know, Hank Azaria or Jim Brooks or you know, pick a comedian, you know, like some of that, I don't want to give up, drop too many names, but you know, like major, major comedians. And th- some of these are very public with talking about it. That's why I mentioned their names. And I helped Kevin set up his podcast, Kevin, the Kevin Pollock chat show back when I started so, this week in startups. Now he's, he's since start, stopped doing it, but uh, he had a great run. 
But just watching Kevin, how quick witty he was, and these other guys, I'd be sitting at the table thinking in between hands, like, wow, the jokes I tell at my poker game, I'm the funniest guy in my poker game, I'm suddenly the least funny guy at this poker game, and I would just study the way they crafted jokes. Um, and, uh, you know, he was very generous with me explaining how jokes were at times. So that was where <laughs> I kind of got like a little... It was like going to it was like going to the groundlings or something like you just got to sit there and watch them craft jokes um, and break each other's chops. And so I fit right in and I, I learned a lot about it there. So that that was my quick education. on it. Uh, but I would like to get a, a comedy coach at some point, somebody to kind of train me on it. And uh, I was just at a roast. So um, I was just asked to be the roast MC at uh, a birthday party recently. And uh, people said, like, you could do this for a living. And uh, I feel there's like no you really upped your game. I mean, since the uh, have I? Yeah. Well, like the, a little, maybe like you a little a credit to the workshopping factor. Like you got producer yes. Nick in there. Like yeah, yeah, I do have producers. It is a team well, effort. You're clearly it's taking it seriously. So you're taking your comedy. It's a seriously. funny family, is what it I is. I would say. I yeah, Calicanus taking it seriously. Yeah, my my producer Nick uh, Calacanis, who is also my nephew, um, who I poach from Major League Baseball, where he was the number one editor uh, to come work here on this show, is uh, naturally funny as well. So we will sit in a Google Doc coming up with goofy things to say about the besties and we're like oh my god that's that is way too harsh <laughs> and you know and, oh my god that's way so literally the dialogue is like ooh, we got to bring that back 20 percent. so what you hear in those intros which i'm going to stop by the way because it i think it's getting tiresome to do it every week like i think six or seven weeks in a row is enough um those are probably 60 70 percent of the the punches are pulled there so you can imagine Ooh. like some of these oh. could be i would love to see those work. google docs Ooh. oh that google docs i, know, someday I would be canceled leak the history yeah, instant <laughs> cancel yeah, i would be like oh yeah i turned off my edit history on that i can blame nick and the ah, other producers like that's work. them i didn't edit that one um you're taking that to the grave yeah so did anybody i mean a lot of other uh founders i guess uh you know chimed in on this i like desk trainers or you could try 37 year old female entrepreneur who started a company now worth over a billion dollars successfully transitions to a new leadership role having previously recruited an excellent successor <laughs> the end the end right and business we're story. done just make it a business mm. story yeah or we and then we could interview her and ask her about her great success and what she plans oh. on doing next and her lessons in business oh wait that would be pro-capitalist aoc elizabeth warren and bernie sanders don't like that and our surprises don't like pro-capitalism oh my god you guys uh, are hilarious well speaking you of things out? Oh. Oh yeah, we should have her on. Yeah. yeah come on. Totally have her yeah. on. Come I've on. been trying to have the away founder on for a long time. Yeah. A long time. Uh, but I think Steph Corey just I think for her, like do you I understand why she hasn't come on or she doesn't talk about it, because do you want your career to be defined? Yeah. Yeah. By you know, this right. label and then have right. everything be like So are you a girl boss or like what was it like to be called a girl boss? You know? Well, it's just like that was one of the actually I thought was cool. You haven't released it yet, but so I'm looking forward to watching it. But the the whole Palmer Lucky thing, like oh, know, yeah. that was whatever you think about what happened, he's moved on, you know, <laughs> and like built something else. And like that's the best thing to do. I think you are yeah, that and that's coming out this week, by the way. I saved it for last. I decided it would be better to make it the last one, let everybody talk about it for like a an extra week and just let it be the last one. But yeah. The woman There's from a, the wing, she got she got barbecued too at some point mm -hmm. but here know. we are out here like adam newman's got a show about himself and we're still yeah. like i unironically love him and would give him money yeah like <laughs> i i said this about the away founder i was like anybody who's going to rally their troops to work harder over the holiday to make the company successful and, mm -hmm. and keep their jobs and and you know make it a viable concern like i think that's a great discussion to have like hey we're going to sacrifice our christmas so people can get presents under their trees and then you know what? Everybody's going to take an extra long uh, July 4th Memorial Day. We're going to have our Christmas in the summer at this company because like Amazon workers who give up their right. Christmas, like mm -hmm. there are Amazon workers who work seasonally for the 60 days before Christmas who give up their Christmas to get paid a bunch of money to make sure we all get our kids gifts, you know, in the mail. Like and they're the modern the day Santa Clauses. Like this happens like NVIDIA, like Jensen Huang is one of the best CEOs of all time. Mm -hmm. And in the late nineties, they were NVIDIA was effed and the way he fixed it was, and this was all him. He said they laid off 70% of the company, seven zero <laughs> and they 
said the only way we are when they did that david they said here's who's staying <laughs> yes if your exactly. name's not on this who's list laid off. you're who's, done who's staying here's who's staying list <laughs> and so Keep going. With the Sorry. remaining only 30 percent of the company he was like the only way we're going to survive is if we ship the next generation of our products six months ahead of the competition so we just lost 70 percent of the company and now we were moving at the same pace as the industry now we need to move like a hundred percent faster, right. <laughs> and that's thirty percent of stuff, right? You yeah. know, or like you know, Facebook. Remember the Zuckerberg used to do the lockdowns at Facebook. Like there'd be yes. some competitive threat or something. Can you imagine like, a lockdown. woman founder nobody did a lockdown the office? Somebody like, would call the cops, <laughs> right? They like call nobody, the SWAT team. Nobody leaves the office until this competitive situation is resolved. Like you know, imagine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, people don't know about those lockdown situations. He would he would say, "We're on lockdown for the thirty next thirty days. We're going to beat this competitor. I'm going to be here every day. And uh, if you want to work this company, you need to match my energy." We're moving so. cots into the office, like <laughs> full stop. Yeah, I mean, people used to. There was an old VC trick. People don't know this, but they used to if they when they were deciding if they were going to invest, they would just uh, drive to the uh, office on the weekend. Where they would go, they or would Friday evening or yeah, Friday yeah. evening, whatever, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, just to see how many cars they would count the cars, you know, in the parking lot. Yeah, this company is crushing it. We might care. be coming back into that era. That's probably a good thing. I think so. Uh, well, so. speaking of capitalism, uh, oh, is this the Atlassian how, founder story? Yeah, let's talk about Ooh, how we I feel about the new like. We know we've had a secret oligarchy running everything for a really long time, and so now we have a whole new class of populist billionaires let's go take it let's over go. i'm here go. for it let's go <laughs> <laughs> love it so the let's setup go here. capitalism <laughs> if you hated capitalism <laughs> in Ooh. the second segment of the show when do you get to the third wait until you get to the part where now we we only I now imagine anybody listens to this show and hates capitalism for no, so no, long this, we yeah. thought that no help was coming but it turns out we have an equal and opposite billionaire reaction mm. And here we go. Okay, the news that I'm referring to is that Atlassian founder and CEO Mike Cannon Brooks uh, successfully took a giant stake in Australia's largest energy company, AGL, which is one of Australia's, if not Australia's single largest carbon emitter. It's like a big coal burning company. Um, and it was going to spin off its coal fired power plants and create this like lovely little, you know, extra business. Um, and Mike Cannon Brooks stepped in tried to buy the whole thing, which was rejected, then acquired an 11% stake because mm. he was like, no, 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 you can't spin off these coal-fired power plants while Australia is on fire mm -hmm. 80% of the year. You need yes. to shut them down. 85% of AGL's energy comes from coal. He made this huge uh, bet and they the effort to create this spin-off coal-fired company was voted down by the board. He basically... And a bunch of executives are leaving too. Including the CEO. This is so brilliant. I mean, if companies are going to behave badly and they're companies and you want to affect change at them, you can complain on Twitter or you can buy the stock. This mm -hmm. is hostile brilliant. takeovers for social good. As activism. As activism. Like, we, I think we should even, I would avoid right now, right now, it's arguably for social good. It doesn't necessarily have to, right? Like, we've certainly seen these sure. takeovers for this is a, various this is a tool reasons. That be used takeovers were traditionally anybody. for profit. Right. Right. It was a business decision. This is a business, this is not a business decision necessarily. Yeah. It certainly doesn't seem like one. It's a tool that could be used for good or for ill, but it is very, very interesting. Like the yeah. board takeover as activism or we'll buy the company. We were saying this last week in, in semi-seriousness, like, should we buy Colt? Like, can we do yeah, that? That was my Would idea. That, Would $200 that million dollar company. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, uh, your, your idea, both your idea too, about, um, you know, like the NRA, what did you, what did you say? Uh, they deploy 250 million a year in, uh, in, you could um, just outspend them. Yeah, yeah, just, just outspend them. them. Start a new organization. Yeah. Like the anti-NRA. Yeah. Americans for them. reasonable Americans for reasonable gun control. I learned yeah. over the weekend, actually, when I was tweeting about this, that um there is an organization that already exists in the spirit, because we talked about Mothers Against Drunk Driving, which is was mm. this incredibly, you know, effective political organization. There's one called Moms Demand that's very similar, like founded in the same. I mean, we could just overfund the shit out of that. Let's mm. go, you know, like let's go and go to every candidate that the NRA has offered money to. Say I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars more than them, but you can't take their money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if he owns 11%, I don't win anymore. 
Like, yeah. I don't want to convince anybody. I just want to buy more politicians than the other guy. Like, if that's the system we have, and frankly, yeah, it seems like this is the billionaire silly. plan, let's go. My plan is coming complete. See, <laughs> David, I just hire the journalists <laughs> from the woke publications, <laughs> and then just I give them the us. capitalism, and then I'm like, so, Molly, we could talk <laughs> about this, or, or we, we could do can something. buy or something. We do something, or we could just place some bets which are also so good for us. It's really true. It started with climate. I was like, I don't have time to change anybody's mind. Now I'm like, I don't, I don't know. You know what? Like, I don't, I'm not interested in your, like, yeah. just, I just want to stack more politicians on my side. <laughs> uh, you know, it's what's great about this also is like, he's a young guy. He's 42. At last seen is a tremendous company. Um, and I think this is, dare I say, cool as it is um, like, I mean, it people, legitimately is. I mean, he is so cool. Mike, Cannon Brooks. Uh, this guy gets J. Cal's coolest f award for 2022 because he could have taken his money. I don't know how much he spent to do this. I, I'm looking for the number here, but you know, this this was not cheap, I'm sure. Um, whatever he spent on this 11%. Okay, maybe he makes some money, makes some money. But there's other people who are buying boats, you know? Yep. Yeah. You know, there's Seriously. other people buying a new plane. Get in the game. And, and and this is like if you think, if you're optimizing for joy in your life. You're in Australia, as Molly, people don't know uh, necessarily, uh, but the wildfires in California, when they see the wildfires in Australia, they're like, oh, f so much. Worse. <laughs> you know, like yeah. our wildfires are like, really? Ooh, dude, put that out. Mm -hmm. It was serious. That country was seriously on fire. And it's very simple. Like, and, and they have the Great Barrier Reef. People, Australia is a long way away. You go to Australia because it's the most amazing ecology you know ecological journey you could make in the world or, you know or it's top five you know yeah. along with africa and south america and a couple of other places what he's doing is so cool um and it, it, it ultimately could be profitable because if they are making their money off of 85 percent coal and he says hey let's try nuclear let's try solar let's do wind let's do this let's do that maybe this becomes profitable yeah and so i love the idea of a group of people buying cult and saying you know what we're going to have a terms of service. Here's our terms of service. Our terms of service, because you can do business things that are good for business. Our terms yes. of service is, if you buy this gun, um, we can't force you to take this course on gun safety or this license because your, your state doesn't have it. But in your state, we're just not going to sell the guns. And, and if your state wants these guns, you need to have a, a test because we don't want to be party to selling guns in a state just like Elon doesn't sell Teslas in a state where you have to have um, dealerships. dealerships because what do dealerships add? Nothing. They screw customers. So it's like, if you, if you don't let me sell direct and, you know, and, and fix the car, I'm not selling there. So, and then what if Colt or some other gun manufacturer said, you know what? Our minimum age is 25 years old to buy this gun. Okay. Yeah. You could sue us, but we're, we're just going to make a minimum age. If you want to buy like a, a two shot rifle to go hunting and you take the test. Yeah. We'll sell it to an 18 year old, but, could a, could a gun company put a minimum age to buy their guns or put minimum training? Like if you if you want to buy software, there are some companies that won't sell you the software unless you send somebody to training because they know you're going to fail with the yeah. software. That's for software. Mm -hmm. well, this is what's Nobody so cool. dies what's from cool software. About, uh, what's right. cool about capitalism too. This is one of our 12 yes. major lessons that acquired, which is you get the partners, customers, whatever you ask for. Like this could be a good business decision because yes. exactly. if you do this, you're going to attract all the people and I'm sure there are a large number of people who are in the concentric circles of want to own guns or own guns and don't want school shootings to happen anymore. Like there I are would a say lot that's of people. 99 point mm -hmm. a thousand nines. Yeah. The only like, person so if, who doesn't agree with that is the school shooter. Like if you right, make exactly. yourself the if you make yourself the Patagonia of gun makers. Right. And then on top of that, you're lobbying. You know, Explain what you mean term. by that. Since people great. may not know, Molly. Well, you so, Patagonia, Patagonia, so, so, you know, Patagonia is a clothing wear company, obviously, but they were, I think, for a very long time, like a B Corp. They were a social good organization. Yeah. They uh, have put into for one of the things they did recently was basically say, like, you know, they're the favorite vest maker of bankers and hedge fund mm -hmm. traders and Silicon Valley guys. And Patagonia said, hey, we're not going to sell our vests mm -hmm. to you anymore. Hedge mm -hmm. funds. Uh, so, so that you can put your logo on it and have it on top of ours, because we think that you the the things that you're doing in society are net negative. Hmm. So you can't buy our product for that use. It's hilarious, so right? They were it's just like, no, than that too. They uh, 
you know, they make clothing, which is a, uh, the act of doing that is not good for the environment, but they're like, we're going to stay on, you know, recycle our clothing. We're going to take back <laughs> our mm. clothing. We're going to recycle. Like it's, a uh, the, the whole Fantastic. ethos of everything they yeah. stand for is like people who want awesome new clothes, but who also care about the environment. Like mm. you can totally do this with guns. They were one of the first retailers to set up. Yeah. Like a resale operation. You could a hundred percent do this with guns. And then you pair that with a public policy arm and a lobbying arm. I mean, I a hundred percent agree with you. And this is actually what I like about the, the billionaire sort of like board takeover as opposed to philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, it's agenda setting, but we live in a world where billionaires get to set agendas and they always have, right? That yeah. nothing, There's nothing new about that. So if they're going to set an agenda, use financial incentives, which are frankly even stronger than yeah. philanthropy, which is like diffused and, and has all this like bureaucracy attached to it. I mean, the way that the, what is it, Little Red, Little Engine is w the, the activist shareholders that took over the Exxon board. It was mm. ultimately a financial argument. And I think that it's sort mm. of the same thing here with AGL, which is like, these are the companies that are in a position to just flip a fucking switch mm. and blanket this planet with renewable energy. And instead, they're trapped in this kind of like sunk cost fallacy of coal, of, of, mm. of coal or oil or natural gas. Coil, yeah. Coil. Coil well, is what's killing cool, us. Though, is like in, in, you know, we've seen it examples of this too. It's not just billionaires who can do this same. Like billionaires can do this, obviously. But yes. like, look at GameStop, right? Like Reddit can do this too. Yes. Yes. Great transition. Yes. Is Great transition because tomorrow so is GameStop Elon, earnings. Yeah. We have Elon doing, uh, you know, in his mind, freedom of speech with Twitter. You have uh, Mike doing uh, coal and renewable energies. Like maybe somebody does guns. Do you guys have any other ideas as we wrap this? Like, I mean, I will say, I think a social Mike good. Mike is making Elon's social good play look a little bit lame by comparison. Well, he's the guy who I mean, done Elon's this. also saying. building Tesla. So <laughs> he's, right, he yeah, does have a, he does he has dipped his toe into the environmental he world. He could have been all in on it. I, I, no, you know, I like think this is going to spur a lot of people thing. into action because like if, if you think about Bezos, this $10 billion climate pledge, that's going to go to a bunch of donations. Mm -hmm. Like would yeah, that have been better to just buy? It, so that Seattle arena we were talking about, it's climate pledge arena. It's the Amazon. Yeah. Amazon paid for it. But they All called right. it the climate pledge arena. But yeah, would but that money have been better spent if Amazon was like, we're taking a stake in this or we're spinning up mm, a renewable yeah. energy company or we're buying a utility oh, because utilities yes. are like literally just standing in the way of renewable energy rollout. Or we're buying 10% of 10 utilities. You know, we're just going to buy 10% of 10 utility companies and we're on the board. We're going to yeah. put somebody on there and there'll be somebody there just steering the discussion towards what are our renewable goals here? Well, you know, and how can much you make more profit than your tax benefit from your philanthropy, right? Like what are the, how do the incentives start to shake out here? Well, if you think about that, Molly, if let's say Mike makes a profit on this, yeah, let's say he doubles his money. Yeah. Now he can do it twice. <laughs> he can do it two more times. Yeah. Or, you know, like if he doubles his money, he can do it again and still keep the main, if he could actually sell his stake in this company and then do it two more times. Yeah. Totally. So, it's, it's the, it's it. the old Evergreen. Amazon, um, strategy which is one of the most brilliant of all time which is look at your income statement take all of your biggest expense line items and turn those into revenue streams like yes. that's the way you win that's how you yeah. build aws <laughs> yeah marketing turn your marketing expense turn your technological expense into a, a thing so i guess we should check in on now this issue of gamestop are we going to that the, the results come out tomorrow do you know yeah any, they're doing any? earnings tomorrow okay. which i'm excited to discuss okay. we can sort of tease ahead to that maybe but yes yeah. it's i i will tell you that i spent five minutes down the actually i spent like 25 minutes because time goes fast down the twitter rabbit hole of what the gme and amc apes are doing and i mean yeah. you like you dig into that and the call to war and you want to like pound five monster energy drinks and put your life savings into amc like it's intense yeah they're it's intense they're going for it <laughs> i mean uh, didn't Melvin Capital go under? I mean, Melvin I Capital went under, so they're yeah. just like we're winning already. The short squeeze is coming. It's like I, I would not. I said this to our chat today. Like, don't sleep on the hedge fund holy war that yeah. is these retail investors, and it's actually of a piece. It's right. It's all the same thing. Like, we have run out of tools politically, globally, mm -hmm. and so now we're using money. And frankly, money is probably the most effective tool money that talks. exists. Well, money's yeah. why this the that, it's better than bullets senators that's for sure not, you know yeah. like money is the reason why these school shootings keep happening let's be completely honest oh, like absolutely so yes that's the, the most the game you should use like just 
play the you know Gurley talks about this all the time you gotta play the yeah. game on the field like game on the you field gotta play me. the game on the field absolutely yes. i mean if you look at like the nba like you used to be able to do hard fouls then you couldn't uh, you know, flopping worked flopping doesn't work you know like right. they, they change the rules you got to adjust right and if, you, if you're going to be a flopper in 2022 you're not going to get the call and you, you could even get call a call against you for flopping amc my lord like talk about a crazy bet to make these maniacs with what happened with top gun and what maybe will happen with jurassic park and the market collapsing all these shorts like i know it's down 50 percent, but what if they have like this like blockbuster summer it might be and right. the stock goes up and and movies come back and it's like paradoxical because people are just like you know what streaming is so boring like sitting at home on my ipad watching this like yep. i would have much rather watched obi-wan kenobi in a theater if it was in theaters i would have paid for a ticket yeah. i would have rather have watched it with a bunch of yeah. star 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 wars nerds than watch it alone or you know with my family only i want to take my family out to see obi-wan in a movie theater it's really true like we went to top gun and you, people were cheering and by oh. people, Aww. I mean me. <laughs> you were All right, you got me hype. I'm going <laughs> to go see it in like, theater. I'm going tonight now. I think I'm going to go tonight. And like, yeah. yeah, it's, but it, it, there is something pretty magical about that. I agree. I, it's all like, all the rules are changing and revolution doesn't look like you think it looks. And mm -hmm. I think in this case, it looks like Mike Cannon Brooks. It looks like these retail investors, like it's all of a piece and it's a real interesting time to be alive. Yeah. So it is. Let's go capitalism. Who Let's am go. I even, Jason? <laughs> exactly. Yes, I got you. Yes. I got Transformation you. No, I mean, complete. Capital. I mean, I think, it, it, you know, one of the things about being a journalist is uh, your powers are muted. You know, like you have the power to uh, all of a sudden you find yourself screaming like this should change. And here's all the information, folks. And then nothing changes. And you're like, yeah, or it's changing too slowly. And, you know, we can place a bet sometimes and and the and the maybe the change happens quicker you know and in in the case of this coal uh burning uh, energy company like he placed the bet and now the change happens instantly like they were going to spin these coal plants out they were going to run amok and now it's like oh nope we're gonna you know take a different approach so placing bets you know can work i, I really would like to see these stock uh stonk people on um you know the GameStop folks and AMC come up with a a, a noble target, and I think the noble target Coach should be the be, yeah. the, well, the guy. I was about to say it. Thank you. If you're listening, AMC and GME Stonk Army, I am appealing to you to own as much of the gun companies as possible and create change through owning their stock. That would be a noble mission. So go ahead. I think. Uh, you know, if you look, you have uh, Ruger, which it makes the pistol I own, uh, the GP100. Ruger is publicly traded. Mm -hmm. uh, and Smith & Wesson, I believe, SWBI. So maybe start buying up those stocks start and then stocks. start saying, like, what changes should the gun companies make in terms of the terms mm -hmm. of service? We have a terms of service. You can't open your iPhone. You know, like, you can't edit the software. We give you all these things you can't do. You know, you, you have to buy apps through the app store. You can't jailbreak your phone. Take the same approach with guns. Yeah. You know, I do want, I'm going to save you from the trolls right now and just say that the mission that they are on right now is to kill the hedge funds. Which so I they in their already mind believe. is noble. Yes. Well, yeah. I mean, right. The, How the, about a, an even more noble mission? An even more noble mission because in this case, your we've next decided, noble mission. Yeah. Let's next not, noble um, mission. How next about noble this? mission. Let's not kill kids for money. Let's not yes. do that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let's not let money. Uh, yeah, that I mean, it's literally the cynicism is so staggering. deep, like it's staggering. It's like, really, I, it, it, NRA gives Mitt Romney, you know, 10, 15 million dollars. The, the guy was a hedge fund guy, right? Yeah. Mitt Romney is, bil was, is uh, Mitt Romney a billionaire? He was Bain. Yeah. Yeah. Is he a billionaire yeah. or just worth a cent? Probably. Just a cent a millionaire. Like, he, can you imagine? You, he has a lot of money. He's either a cent a million or a billionaire. Somebody fact check me. Can you imagine the level of cynicism? You're a cent a millionaire or, bil or billionaire, and for 14 million over 10 years or whatever he got that money from Ooh. the NRA, yeah. whatever it is, it's like a huh, well, 1.4 million, million a year, 13 yeah. million, 1.3 million Total. a year. Maybe he's been mm -hmm. taking it for 20 years, and you like it's chump change for you. That's like your seventh house, but you sold your soul to vote yeah. for these maniacs with zero gun control. Like zero is the goal, really? Yeah. Zero? zero? It is funny, yeah. If less if, than uh, cars. Less than cars, less than cigarettes. If, 
if Wall Street Bets or Elon or somebody, you know, said we're going to go buy Smith and Wesseners, like, right, it would, uh, it would that start would a everything. huge movement. It would change everything. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Like, let's, let's go. do it. It's better. It's you know what? It's better than waiting on Congress. Yeah, right. That, and that company would do great. Like, and that sales company would, go would do great. The roof. Yeah. Mitt Romney net worth. Who knows if this is true? It's on the internet, so it's probably not. But four hundred fifty million. So literally, like. 10% would be 45. It's 3% of his net worth. He could have just paid for th that money to be in office himself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, yeah. and now he has to be the number one contributor, on contributing taker of the murdering yeah. sociopaths at the NRA. I, and I am a gun owner and I believe in reasonable gun ownership. It's I mean, no longer the same thing, right? There used to be gun culture, no, and now yeah, there's yeah. like this militarization and this obsessive, and it's all been like there's sort of taken over by white supremacists. It's like a real owning actual a owning an yeah. AR-15 and yeah. selling that to people who are deranged. Like that's a that is not the same thing. Sixteen, yeah, I mean, and, and also eighteen years old. Like really, yeah, eighteen? It's just like uh, I maybe eighteen drink, for like, one gun, maybe like a rifle, and if you want to use that gun. Like, what is it when your kids drive? Like, for the first two or three years, you have to have a, a driver's learner's license permit. and it's only a learner's, yeah, learner's permit. permit. Mm -hmm. You got a learner's permit. You got to have somebody in the car. It's only during the day. Maybe you're not allowed on the highways until you get the second one, right? It was like a two phase thing in New York when I grew up. You could be on like local streets, then the highway. Like, just reasonable stuff. Like, reasonable not stuff. Like crazy a pilot's stuff. license. Not a like, band. you have to have a certain amount of hours at a gun sure. range there you before go. you, you know, right. like, yeah. 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 And then when you're at the gun range, you have to talk to somebody at the front desk and maybe they could red flag you if they think you're nuts. I talked to somebody who's a friend of mine who's going to make a red flag, independent red flag database where anybody is going to be able to report somebody and then they're going to pay for the background. They're going to check that the person reporting it is a real person mm. and then they're going to spend the money through to let local authorities know. They're going to make their own red flag database. And I, I was like, this is a brilliant idea. I mean, that's Can you imagine if it works? Yeah. I was like, I'll donate to that. I think it's even better, though, just to own the gun companies. Like, go right to the source. Oh, pay absolutely. Come I mean, what's the market Pair it with cap? data. Pair it with, like, yeah. proper lobbying and marketing, frankly, which not everybody's always great at. And then just buy them. Yeah. Become Bruger, the majority shareholders in every public gun company. By the way, Bruger, Bruger's worth $1.2 Like... It's, it's 140. It's nothing. It's 120 million. Like we could raise that on this show. Probably we just say to everybody, like anybody want to chip in with us and buy yeah. Ruger? I mean, Smith and Weston's got to be worth more. Ruger's a smaller company, I would guess. But yeah, let's see what Smith and Weston's worth. Here we go. SWBI is worth no. Smith and Weston's worth 709 million. I mean, what? for God's sake, get out of here. Yeah, and these things trade like this. at a three PE. The ratio is three. It's so a three wow. PE wow. ratio. Ruger's uh, PE mm -hmm. is eight. Economic warfare people. Smith and Wesson is who we're talking about. And the nobody's oh missed that. You could make yeah. so much money doing this too. Like, you could make I bet so they, much I bet money. these stocks are depressed yeah, because just... everybody's like, oh, all this craziness mm -hmm. going on. Nobody... But if you buy them and you're like, no, we're going to embrace. Well, control, and ironically, the stock great. goes up every time yes. there's a shooting because we're the worst country on earth. But it goes up to three times price to earnings. Like... You yeah, better. companies are depressed. Patagonia of gun companies is a thing. Hmm. Okay, here we go. Now, I got, I got right, some. Let's do it. How do I let's mobilize go. a group, like a syndicate of sorts, to buy ten percent of Smith and Wesson <laughs> and get a board seat <laughs> on Smith and Wesson? There were for right. yeah. the syndicate. Yeah. 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 Like the action. <laughs> ten thousand ish uh, ish people, high net worth individuals. individuals who wanted to. Collectively, we put seventy million dollars. Very buys. impactful group chat. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. yeah. we've got to figure that out. All right, everybody. Thanks, yeah. Dave, for coming it's been on a the great show. show. Follow oh, David on Twitter. Go search for Acquired. Listen to Acquired, and um, yeah, more Pretty shows good. to come. Always Acquired FM here. on uh, Twitter. Thanks for coming on, and we'll see you everybody next time. Bye bye. Bye bye. Great show, everybody. Bye.